Good evening, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, wherever you're watching. Welcome to World War II TV, another live stream. I'm Paul Woodad. Joining me today, we have three uh, roving, well, two, two are roving, one is static, uh, three historians. Uh, in England, joining us is Ben Main, and Ben Main is particularly going to be talking about the East Riding Yeomanry, but also giving some overviews and things like that, and the benefit of his research. Out in the field, we have Duncan Hollands, who is going to be following some of the 59th Staffordshire uh, division and what they're doing. This is Duncan's feed. Colin is joined. Colin Taylor is joining us a bit later. Colin is going to be following the Canadian advance, uh, particularly the Highland Light Infantry. And I'm in the studio, which is my office, kind of keeping it all together and trying to make it all make sense and, uh, and do some stuff. So... Um, Operation Charnwood was well underway, nearly concluded the first day of it, 76 years ago today. It started on July the 8th. And of course, don't forget those watching, this is a two-parter. We have part one tonight covering the approach into Caen. And then tomorrow night, we're going to be looking at the actual seizing of Caen itself. And we'll be filming in the city centre and matching up some then and now photos. And that'll be lots of good fun. And different historians tomorrow. I'm having uh, Karine Poulard, a French historian and guy, joining me for that, who is from Caen. And it makes sense that someone from Caen talks about Caen. And then uh, Gwen and Mag will be our camera team tomorrow. But that's tomorrow. So today is all about Operation Charmwood. So I'm going to put it on the, all four screens for a second. So I don't want to get too bogged down into too much background, but obviously June the 6th is the date of the landings. And then after the initial probes in land on June the 7th, things get very static for the next um, three or four weeks because of, well, basically lots of Germans in the way, uh, lots of very good and very effective Germans, 21st Panzer, 12th SS. And those who are watching my um, Chateau de la Londe um, uh, video or live stream a couple of weeks ago with um, uh, Mark Forsdyke, that was June the 28th. We've now rolled forward another 10 days to July the 8th. But things hadn't progressed very much. Exactly. If you remember where we left off that live stream, um, I'll show you. A map. I'll bring a map up. First map of the day. It's actually with French captions, but there we go. So this is a, um, a, a, a an Operation Charmwood map. And you can see Caen in the middle there, the big city of Caen, which is now almost since the World War II doubled in side, size. So... For example, Hill 64, which you can hear there, Cote 64 is the French. That's now been swallowed up by Caen. So um, we're going to be talking today about this area over here, really, the uh, Buron galmanche area, saint Contest. That's where we're focusing. And the reason we're focusing on that area there is that's where the, 50, the, the British 59th Division was, and then over here, the 3rd Division, the Canadian 3rd Division. Because over here... And my great uncle, who we'll be talking about tomorrow, was in 2nd Battalion, Royal Ulster Rifles, um, coming in with the 3rd Division. This area here, Labusy, Labusy Wood, well, that's mostly been swallowed up by Herouville St. Clair now. So there's not very much authentic, authenticity in, in doing taking the camera to that area there. So we're, we are going to focus on the two divisions over here, simply because this area here, if you follow my mouse, is, is just not very... Um, visual 76 years on but if you remember that suffolk's chateau de la Londe, that finished here in uh la bijoude and eprons that was over here and then we're moving over today so duncan is currently in um uh villon les buissons which is over actually not marked on a map here but it's just north of um galmont which is about here near about the r as charmwood is and Colin is a little bit further west, and we'll follow in some things. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop talking a bit now and bring Ben in, um, and I'm gonna ask Ben to do a little bit of um, uh, introduction as well. So Ben, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Evening again, Paul. And um, you you you've particularly focused on Charmwood for uh, and the battles around Con for some time, haven't you? Yeah, just following on from the research and work that I've done with Alan King and around the first East Riding Yeomanry. Uh, it kind of mirrors really what you've just said in the introduction, the, especially for the East Riding Yeomanry. They've been sat in these positions since the, uh, the 8th of June. They've had the same views and the stalemate you've described. They're not going anywhere. They're seeing the same village in front of them. And then Charmwood is that first opportunity and that big push of, along a broad front around the northern edge of Khan to get moving and begin to progress and make ground into Khan. 
Yeah, and we've had that issue as well of the fact that we, we had a bit of supply delays in the middle of the month because of the big storm that hit the coast and the Mulberry Harbour, the American Mulberry Harbour got, you know, enormous destroyed and the British one was slowed down. So it's taken us a while. And Duncan, are you listening? Are you there, I'm here. Duncan? Yeah, because I'm still here. Some, you did some um, work into the, uh, the, the, uh, the supply need for the 59th Division. So what was that figure you quoted to me? You said something about they, need, they, they wanted 17... You tell me. You, you remember it, don't you? Okay. So, basically, on the morning of the 8th of July, the artillery side of things, just the artillery side of things, they had 19 field regiments with 200 and 88 25 pounders, 168 105s, uh, which totaled to 456 guns. Then eight medium regiments with 128 5.5 inch guns, two heavy regiments with 16 155 millimeter guns and 16 7.2 inch guns. And they also had the warships, which we'll talk about later, behind me again. So that's just to give you an idea of the artillery just for this little but, item. But didn't you say something about the fact they wanted to have 17 days worth of supplies but at a, to for any operation, but they only ever had about 12, something like that, 12 well, days or something? Yeah, yes, and did he, did he, did So, uh, um, the 3rd of July, the uh, supply chain had reached 13 days of reserves so basically they had 13 days worth of everything behind us behind aramorsh but right. they needed 17 days for a big push so they yeah. were awfully worried about this by going forward with uh charmwood and then obviously they were worried about what they were going to use and were they going to have enough supplies for goodwood which came later so yes it was a big issue with supplies because the, the issue is is what we, we that that we have three divisions attacking in Sharnwood effectively although not all our brigades are committed but defending on the german side is really only one under strength luftwaffe division uh the 21st panzer division who are under strength and some elements of the 12th ss so we we kind of outnumber the germans i don't know what i kind of guess at the figures at least two to one maybe three to one but they have the really good ground because i'll bring up that map again and then ben ben feel free to, to jump in at any point there the, the Germans are still herring, uh, herring, holding the area over here, Nick. Uh, although Karbike Airport has been seized on July the 4th in Operation Windsor, there's still a hell of a lot of German artillery over here in this sort of western part of Caen there. And you've got the 10th SS, 12th SS over there. Though they're under some pressure from the, from the 43rd Division over here, there's a lot of artillery. And then up kind of north in this area here where we're going to be focusing on today, the Abbey Dardenne famously was where the Kurt Meyer of, of the 12th SS was. There's still quite a lot of German armor, the 26 Panzer Regiment there, but they're kind of being squeezed on all sides now. But they're getting into a kind of a do or die situation now, aren't they? Where they kind of feel they're not going to get a fall back. So they're, it's that kind of wounded animal quality a bit where as we push on them and they've got these open weevils. And again, I want to just emphasize, I'll, I'll, I'll put Colin uh, Duncan's view up fully there because... Tomorrow we're going to be talking very much about an urban environment where you cannot get tanks into the city of Caen very easily because of the rubble. Today it's open wheat field. And, and remember, we're filming this 76 years onto the day. So the two foot of wheat and standing corn we're seeing is pretty much how it would have been 76 years ago. A lot more dust and a lot more um, chaos and confusion and bomb craters. But this open ground that we're having to now push towards uh, Caen the Germans have all their artillery range. They know which way we're going to be coming from because, as Ben said, we've been they've been sitting nose to nose in in uh, with with about two miles or a mile between the German lines and the British lines for nearly a month. So they know where we're going to appear from. They know what our objective is. They know we want to get to Caen to get to the the, the road network and the crossroads. So they know exactly where we're coming. And of course, I'll bring Ben in here. That's going to make our operation costly because of just the ground we've got to cover. So. Um, what was the feeling like in units like the East Riding Yeomanry that morning? Did they feel it was going to be a, a difficult day or what was the mood like? Yeah, the for the normal trooper, the intelligence wouldn't be feeding back to them. But the officers obviously know, and it's worth touching on the, the German perspective side of it. They know that the, the British, the Canadians have been building up resources, supplies, equipment ready for a push. But in turn, although that... Uh, there be the Germans themselves are being harassed daily. 
they also have time to prepare defences in these areas. And the uh, this north-west edge of Khan that, that we're, we're looking at at the minute, they've been able to set up some very comprehensive uh, trench systems, uh, mortar positions, hidden anti-tank gun positions around, uh, if we look at the map as we hear, from Abbey Arden, Bitot, Saint Contest, Galmanche, all around this area, sporadically, you'd find the uh, uh, elements of the, the, is it the first, second, and third battalions of the 25th Panzer Grenadier Regiment. I know uh, the second battalion up at Galmanche themselves, but they're entrenched, they're ready and waiting. The the exact numbers, uh, you're probably looking at. Uh, roughly around 500 men sporadically placed around these villages in entrenched uh, systems waiting for this attack to come forward. But for the for the normal trooper of the East Riding Yeomanry, they're not, probably not fully aware of who they're going to be coming up against. So the officers have been briefed. I've read, read a document today that makes reference to you, you're up against the 12th SS and... Uh, makes reference to British and Canadian prisoners that have been captured by them uh, and then those that have been found dead with wounds uh, or injuries that were obviously given the impression they've been executed basically yeah. so they they know officer wise who they're up against. And we'll talk when we get to Colin later on. I've got an aerial photo that I got courtesy of Mike Bechtold, who, of course, is one of our regular guests, the Canadian. And it clearly shows the anti-tank ditches the Germans have prepared on the roads between Chiron and Buron and villeneuve les buisson and, and, and Buron, which we will stop at. And we had a, it's funny, we went out on a recce a couple of days and we thought we'd found part of an original anti-tank ditch. We got all very excited about it. When we had a look at it and compared to the aerial photos, we hadn't. We just found a, a kind of a sunken track. But for a little while, we thought we discovered some new history. And we got all very excited and... And then we realize it wasn't. But anyway, let's let's focus on the morning of July the 8th. And let's and 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 we obviously the cameras are gonna be moving as we go along. So um we'll start with Duncan because that's where we're we're going. So Duncan is currently um on the main road between villon les buisson down into Caen. Uh, he's in a car heading towards Galmonge later, and Combon Plain is over to his left, and we'll be finishing at Combon Plain later on. That will be our concluding part of the talk, as we're going to finish at one of the Commonwealth War grave cemeteries there, where some of the men, not so much the Canadians, they're buried at Beni sur Mer, but the British, some of those who were killed in this operation, are buried there. Others are at uh, Douvre de Livrand and Hermanville, and, and typically if the British gather, they get spread around. And we'll, we've already had a couple of questions asking us how. Um, how to, to go through casualties and, and tank losses. Well, we'll cover all that when we get towards the end of the, the show. But just look at Duncan's footage there, those watching these open fields. Now, as we hold the camera there, Duncan, that right bang in the middle of the camera there is the hospital in, in Caen, the SHU, the CSU, which we'll be using a lot today as our reference point because Caen doesn't have any massive great skyscrapers. The only building it has is the 19-storey uh, hospital there, which is our really good reference point. And I don't know whether Ben knows this, they're, they're gonna be, it's going to be taken down in the next few years. They're building a lower hospital in the next few years. So at some point, oh. all of us tour guides who use the hospital as a reference point, we won't better do it anymore. So I think Maybe we maybe. tour guides have to buy it and use it as a shell uh, just, to, just to use it for reference point because it is the one way we have of showing yeah. Connie's over there, there's the hospital. Yeah, And we're talking at this, we're, we're talking what? three miles to the edge of corn from there duncan not even that really yeah two and a half two and a half miles and so we're talking about a day to get two and a half miles but that's two and a half miles with a hell of a lot of germans in the way well not so much a hell of a lot germans with very very well prepared positions with artillery that knows what it's doing knowing exactly where we're going to be emerging from and we've got to try and advance our three divisions into an area that's really not very far away. i'll bring that map up again i'm going to be bringing this up frequently so the scale of that um, is uh, uh, two kilometers is there. OK, so we're trying to squeeze our entire front. So we're starting up here, the, the, the start line for Charmwood, and that's where we kind of are on the start line there. So we're starting the three divisions. So British third here, British 59th here, Canadian third over there. We're starting over maybe something like 12 kilometers. But as we move down towards here, we're reducing, of course, the, the, uh, the width to maybe seven or eight kilometers so five or six miles so that's three divisions fitting into a ridiculously small area 
um, when you think about it. And there's only really, I say, two understrength German divisions defending over here, but it's the fact they have this ground. Now, we should talk about the bombing, the aerial bombing the night before. Do you want to do that, Ben? Or I... Yeah, I'll let you do that. You're the guest. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, from the uh, the divisional diaries that you can see from the, the ground perspective and from veterans' accounts as well, we know that on the evening of the 7th of uh, July that the RAF are going to put in a preliminary uh, bombing raid ahead of the uh, HR that's roughly around four o'clock in the morning on the uh, 8th of July. Uh, the raid, Lancasters and Halifax is coming in, roughly 450 uh, bombers dropping around 2,000 uh, tonnes of ordnance uh, onto the northern uh, half of Khan and also on the outskirts of the, uh, the city as well. Uh, it was said that uh, the uh, the pilots, uh, bombardiers, were, were told that there was, a, I think it was a five kilometre zone, they were not to drop uh, any ordnance into, uh, for obvious reasons, to protect the British and the Canadians in their forming up position, so no friendly fire would uh, take place. But the, the bombers come in late evening around 11 o'clock uh, at night, and I uh, Speaking to Alan King, he's riding Yeomery about that, what he could remember. Uh, and he says he could remember the waves of bombers coming in directly over the, uh, the coast, over the forming up positions where we have the camera today looking out towards uh, Cams and uh, Galmanche uh, in that direction. Uh, and he could see and hear all these bombers coming over. And his thoughts... Uh, were about the French civilians, and it, it's uh, an important thing to remember the French civilians that were in Cannes at the time. And he he said they they had nowhere to go. Uh, a few years ago, when we returned, we were up on the the Braville Ridge, looking towards uh, Cannes, and he was stood on his own, uh, and it was quite obvious that he was upset. So as you do with the veterans, gave him uh, some space and time to. Uh, uh, let him just observe in his own thoughts. And later on that evening, I asked what he was thinking. And he made reference to the bombing for Operation Charmwood. Uh, and that he said the civilians that just had nowhere to go, that he heard that some of them had put uh, white blankets out on roofs, painted crosses on them. But he he was upset knowing that the uh, these bombers were not able to pick where they could or couldn't drop their ordnance and he knew that many civilians would die and they did i mean we'll fo we'll focus particularly on the bombing tomorrow in the center of calm we can see the, the, re the reconstruction but um it is it's fair to point out a lot of the people of Caen had escaped south to the quarries and things like that so it wasn't the full population of the city and others were in areas under the, in the in the um subways below the cathedrals but yes still many civilian cabs and we're not, not we're going to well on it i mean people like john buckley buckley in his book monty's men are very critical of the british plan for charm with the bombing plan it was kind of hastily put together and it's you know 470 odd six uh lancasters and halifax but then there's some b26s of the eighth air force coming in the morning or ninth air force there's mosquitoes as well and you know there, there was issues with smoke and um and following the right markers things like that and and probably if truth be told it didn't really do anything to dislodge the Germans. I mean, the, from the German accounts we have, they don't seem to be particularly affected by the bombing. Uh, so it was, it was perhaps not a, not a waste because it's you know it's difficult to judge all these things in it. But it was not the most successful bombing uh, of 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 the Normandy campaign. But it is something that all those my great uncle I'll read his accounts tomorrow. You know, they all described the earth shattering that night before and, and the dust coming out of car and they were all thinking about the civilians and what was happening to those poor people and we did drop leaflets but we dropped leaflets to the french only about an hour before the operation and there was no chance for them to actually go anywhere so you know it's um and duncan just raises and duncan wants to, you're, you're driving duncan but um are you are you all right duncan good so duncan is just taking the route off to our second location <laughs> towards galmanche yeah. I was just going to add to that that the fuses on a lot of the bombs that were dropped on the eve of Charmwood were uh, advanced by 20%. So they had a, a six-hour delay. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So, uh, 
and as it was it was done so they would be heading uh, detonating when the advances that Ben and me and you and Colin will be talking about were occurring. So yeah, so even after the bombing, they, the French thought the bombing was over. It wasn't. It wasn't that Trevor. So Duncan's getting to his second spot now. But let's get back. Let's bring Ben in and let's talk about the advance of the East Riding Yeomanry that morning and what was going on because Duncan's is pulling into the little the lair of Galmanche now. So the route Duncan has just driven for us is effectively the route. Uh, that a squadron took on the uh, the morning, uh, just after H hour, uh, half past four in the morning. Uh, a and B squadron begin to move out with their respected uh, infantry. A squadron supporting the first uh, and seventh Royal Warwickshires that would head down to San Contest, but then B squadron in support of the second and sixth South Staffordshire, whose their objective was to take the small uh, it's more a farm than a, than a village really there's a couple yeah. of houses there of of Galmanche. uh b squadron uh, were over to the eastern side we can see the map here from aerial reconnaissance i think it was the 4th of july this was taken by the royal canadian air force so duncan's been coming down this road here and he's turning off soon and he's going to be in this area here. That's changed quite a lot since the war, but you can see, as I'm going to, I'm interrupting Ben there, that the, the, these are the defences of that the, the were set up there before pushing off south towards Khan. And uh, so as we look at this map, A squadron to the left-hand side, B squadron to the right, and uh, just to the north of there is the uh, village of Cams. And that initially masked the movements uh, of the infantry and the the armour as they moved down towards it. But once they were clear of the village, they're then vulnerable and open to this German defensive position. Uh, you can see from, from that map as well, you were looking at around... Let's put it back up. Okay. There we go. There we are. Brilliant, thank you. There, there's at least eight mortar positions in this small area, uh, 75 millimeter anti-tank gun uh, hidden in the, the, the woods uh, and the, the trees, multiple machine gun positions uh, in numerous areas. And you can see also, especially to the Eastern side trenches that then linked up to the village uh, as well. Oh, yeah. So it's a well uh, fortified small location with 360 degree field of fire for anyone that is going to try and progress either onto Galmanche or around it. Uh, so it's a well defensed uh, and well planned position. And now, I mean, Duncan is there now. So Duncan is, 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 showing us the area there's very little to see in terms of obviously the defense there's some little bullet things that duncan may show us on the buildings there is uh the first of the monuments we're going to show those watching today um and um that is that is just there to the 59th division and these riding yeomanry for those we, we haven't explained it yet they were uh, attached to the 59th division for this operation they've been attached to the third earlier in the campaign and they they were they were rotated and put where they were needed but they were attached to the 59th of this which is good for us because it's the most kind of authentic looking area interesting stop at sort of a wall there there's the there's the the court the wheat field there we've had some questions already saying was the, the height of the crops about the same as it was in the war and yeah pretty much all the accounts we read this kind of waist height and bearing in mind people back then were, were a little bit shorter than they are today, especially Alan King. He's, he's the, <laughs> not a tall chap, is he? But so, you no. know, I'm six foot something other. So, yeah. But then, you know, yeah. waist height there makes complete sense for those who are coming there. So the difference is in a little village like this. And if you're coming down that road, you know, via Galmanche, via, via Villain of Vison, you would just take about 15 seconds to pass this little, um, little as, as Ben said, it's just a farm, really, a kind of a... Mm. a, a, a cluster of three or four buildings and yet at the time it's it's it was this this um incredible position that had to be to be um to be cleared and duncan's gonna show us the monument i think now to the 59th division um he's here he's listening to what i'm saying there there we are it's not a very big one and and we might mention tomorrow um um chaplain uh walter brown one of the canadian padres because he was um ambushed by the ss here a few days in this area here and was eventually shot and uh and and um we, we 
murdered by the Germans. We'll talk about that later on, possibly. But he, that was he was ambushed on the main road. It was it was, it was earlier in June. He was trying to find his troops and kind of his 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 jeep kind of drove through the front lines and he bumped into a reconnaissance patrol of the 12th SS, we think. And then that ended up being murdered by the SS. But that's another subject for the day. We will do a show, I think, at some point about the murders of the Canadians by the, the 12th SS and indeed some British troops. But these are the open fields around Galmanche. And um, there's very little to see in terms of the, uh, the the trenches and the fortifications now. But just a, a nothing of a little hamlet that you just drive past in a matter of a few seconds. And yet it was, uh, well, I'll let Ben talk now. But t tell us about the fighting for Galmanche. Yeah, we're, with Operation Charm, we're different infantry uh, regiments. They, uh, some, you could say it was a successful day for them and others, it, it quite clearly wasn't. And at Galmonch, it was definitely quite an unsuccessful uh, day for the South staffs that were assaulting here. Uh, within an hour and a half of the uh, H hour beginning around six o'clock in the morning, information is coming in saying that they are partly towards Galmonch. They're being suppressed uh, by German fire, small arms fire, machine gun fire, mortar fire. The problem for the, uh, the tanks that are in support for B squadron and A squadron, uh, they're struggling to actually assist the infantry because of smoke and dust and the morning mist. So they can't lock on to any targets to really assist. Uh, and it was noted that the 59th Infantry Division being new out into, uh, into Normandy, not that battle-wise, you could say, uh, at this time. This was their first big uh, battle that they took part in. Their tactic was for the tanks to sit behind the infantry as they progressed, where, for example, the 3rd British Infantry Division, their tactics had evolved quite quickly over the Normandy campaign. The tanks were in close with the, uh, the infantry to offer that support, whereas here the South Staffs have pushed on ahead uh, and they don't have that close tank support to bring in uh, fire where it's needed. Uh, at around 8 o'clock in the morning, the uh, core command uh, starts to get information back with what is happening at Galmonch as well. Uh, and it's assessed already at eight in the morning that it's not going to be a, a good day. It's going to be uh, trouble there all day. It's been recorded as in the diaries. I think they appreciate that this was more defended than what they possibly believed. Out on the left flank, uh, more towards Epron Way, the 2nd and 5th uh, Lancashire Fusiliers, uh, just over to the to right there when the, the camera was looking, they were actually due to progress down uh, towards uh, Malon uh, along the main road. But because of the uh, intense fire uh, from Galmonch, they were pinned down from the very start. Uh, and it was around five o'clock in the evening that they were still pinned down and they could not move towards their objectives because of uh, what was taking place at Galmonch and they were withdrawn. Over on the uh, what would be the right flank to the western side of Galmonch, uh, you had the uh, Warwickshires pushing down with the support of uh, A Squadron towards San Contest. But it's quite clear throughout the day at Galmonch that things are not going to plan. Uh, even with tank support, the closer the tanks come in, they are then engaged. You have men with Panzerfaust that are able to shoot and begin to uh, have a go at the tanks. One big thing that was uh, a problem were snipers that you had. The tank commanders sitting with their heads outside of the turrets and it was just after midday that Major Platts, who was uh, the Austrian charge of C Squadron, uh, is shot uh, and killed by a sniper, uh, which causes problems then for C Squadron, uh, who were then lacking uh, support them, uh, and leadership. And it's that same old, same old, isn't it? Of, a, of small groups of very well dug in Germans can can cause terrific problems. You know, two, two, two or three guys with Panzerfaust, one guy with a rifle taking out one commander, and you can cause real problems for 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 the the, the overwhelming numbers of British troops. But we, but, but you know, the Germans have these 
brilliant positions. And well, I think we'll, um, because Colin's been uh, hanging around waiting, we're going to bring in Colin a little bit now and talk about the Canadian, because we're now up to about, you just said they're eight o'clock in the morning. So I think we'll bring in Colin a bit and come back to the Ace Riding Yeomanry and to Duncan in a minute, because Duncan's walking up the track, the building. So I'll bring in Colin now. Are you there, Mr. Taylor? I am here, Paul. How are you? I'm very well. You didn't get bored while we were talking about other things, no, but no, no we're there. No, so, not at all. Not at so all. So let's I bring in want... the Canadians, Colin. Do us a bit. Where are yes. well, well, I'll explain. Well, will you explain where you are? I've... I'm in a little farm lane. Just opposite there is the chateau. Just over there, the phone points in the right bloody direction. So yeah. where those trees are, we've got the chateau. That's for the that direction. That's a... yeah. We have got the hospital in Con. And Duncan is about a kilometre and a half in that direction. Yeah. So you know, the, you, the, two, the two cameras are very close. At we did our recce. You know, they're actually yeah. very, very close. I'll just bring up the map again so we can be really clear where they are. T to be honest, I don't know why, but um, uh, Collins Village is not marked on here. But Ville, uh, Buisson is over here where the A is of, of Armwood there. So coming down the road towards Buron, and then on towards um, OT and uh, that way. Whereas Duncan is over here in Galmont. So, so, so Colin is over here somewhere. So they're, yeah, they're about, you know, a click apart. That's it. No more. So tell us about the Canadian uh, start of the day, Colin. And particularly wow. you're, you're focusing on the high and light infantry. Yeah. 7.30 is kickoff time for the, uh, the high and light infantry of Canada. Uh, they're forming up in vion le buisson and Levere, another little village just behind. And they're starting to form up at around 4.30 in the morning. And in came the daily delivery of German artillery at 5 o'clock, which caused a lot of problems to the briefings, the final briefings. But they're not due to kick off till 7.30. And it is 1st Battalion of the Highland Light Infantry. And D Company and B Company will lead the way. Now, what you have to remember is, on the 7th of June, the Canadians are actually four miles south of here in OT, four kilometers, sorry, and yeah. Buron was already occupied, but the German counterattacks have thrown them out. And so this is basically the Canadian front line is around here from the 7th of June until the 8th of July when Charmwood kicks off. That's the next time it moves. It takes a month for this line to move. Which is and, and later incredible. on, Colin, you're going to show us the monument yeah, back the at Hell's Memorial, Corner yeah. that is one of the unusual monuments them because it has two dates on it. It has the first date the Canadians went through and then the second date when they went through the next time. So it's June yeah. the 7th, July the 7th at Hell's Corner. And again, okay, I'm, I'm repeating myself, but for those watching, look at that open expanse of just killing ground in front of you there. This is not good territory at all to be pushing through. When Colin goes on to his second spot, later on, which is the, uh, the entrance to Buron, where by the anti-tank ditches was, and I'll throw up an aerial photo where you can see these ditches. Colin will tell us about just the, the murderous time they had getting past what, again, you can just drive it these days in a matter of a few seconds. Well, while Colin's talking, I'm going to put, uh, keep on talking, Colin, but um, Duncan's just showing us some bullet holes back at Galmont. So uh, okay. keep, so keep the talking. First, the first battalion will form up. I'm heading down to show you the memorial now, but the first battalion's going to form up. B Company, the main road, if you can if you can see the cars coming up, which I don't suppose you can. Yeah, we're just showing Duncan's bullet holes. We'll come but, back to um, you in a second. I'll show you the road. But B Company are going to be on the left-hand side of the road. D Company will be on the right-hand side of the road. And facing them, of course, is approximately 200 uh, German troops. They're in well-dug-in positions and also well camouflaged positions. The aerial bombardment of the area is totally without success, as you've already said. So everything's pretty intact from a German point of view. They have got this anti-tank ditch, which cuts the main road into Buron, into Buron from Vion, and it also cuts the road that would come up from Chiron into Buron, which will also be attacked by the Nova Scotias. This is a 9th Brigade exercise. So the two companies, not all full, not full strength because they're all left out of battles behind the lines, but they're going to have to come in because of the casualties suffered by the Canadians during this fight into the town. I'm less than I'm about 800 metres from the village. And it's going to take them till 11.30 in the morning to clear out 
And I, I think, was, was yeah, thanks for the bullet holes, by the way, Duncan. And Duncan's walking back to where his van is parked. And again, I, I'm, I'm repeating myself again. The good thing about doing these videos and walking it is just a sense Suffering of how the enormous distance is. casualties. So I will come back to you in a second. Hang on, hang on for a second. Um, you know, when you're driving this as a tourist normally now, you whiz past these places in a matter of a few seconds. But if you get out and you walk it, you realize just how, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the two kilometers between a couple of villages in ground like this. I mean, just you can coming come back and, to the uh, memorial. Park. Yep, no problem. I'll put you back on camera in a second. So um, we'll go back to whoops. Yeah, there's, so there's Colin. At the, so to explain where you are, Colin. I think your connection's gone a bit iffy, Colin. This is what we get known as Hell's Corner to me, you see. I'm a bit iffy. But yeah, so, and you can see clearly on the monument, you've got two dates. 7th of June, 7th of July. Because that is the next time we move. You can also see some mortar fins in the wall. Just there. Have you still got us? Yeah, you're, you're the bad. I think the connection is a bit bad there, but uh, yeah, if you just right. focus it slowly on the mortar, we should be able to get it. It's Francois there. Say hello Hang to Francois on, no, for go, me. Go back to it. Hello, Francois. I think he's listening on the yeah. on his phone. Francois's so another guy. He's, a, he's another French guy. He's come out to, 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 to there. We are. There. Wow, that's a great shot. And that's a mortar fin embedded in the wall there. Can you get us try now? We've got just get a, get a nice slow shot of the uh, of the dates on the plaque for us, and then Colin. Then I'll um. There we go. So Hell's Corner, Le Coin de l'Enfer, seventh of June, forty four, seventh of July. So that's the first time they went Kate went through. And by the way, those watching, we are going to come back. Mark Milner, the Canadian historian, is going to join me for a show where we go back and talk about the advance south of the 9th Brigade on the 7th of June. I know it's sort of back in time, but it's just a question of getting Mark involved. And so we're, 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 we're um, 8th of July today, but thanks for that, Colin. Um, um, anything else you want to say there, or do you want to get drive? Well, I want to I want just see, I mean, the, the landscape has changed. So there's far more buildings. Yeah. I'll just, uh, I'll just uh, whack up a photo uh, now, I've got. But, of, um, hang on, hang on. This, this photo I'm sharing now is is of the Nova Scotia's heading south. Now, some books say this is June the 7th. Some say it's July the 8th. I'm not sure. I'm not going to, you know, guess which one it is. But these are what these rows look like. And it, let's assume that is taken on July the 8th. It doesn't make a difference whether it's which date. It's the same, going to be the same scenario. You know, carriers, infantry moving. You've yeah. got their shovels on their backs there. And there's the same for those. We had a question earlier about were the fields of crops the same height? Well, you can see there in that photo, they were, you know, two foot, three foot high. So yeah, we we are we are bang on. That is the road running through Villon Les Buissons. Yeah, so the is... road runs directly into the heart of Bouron, which is the objective of the Highland yeah. Light Infantry. Great. So Bouron's important because it is a crossroad. It's going to allow the links between the regiments attacking from other directions. So that's why the Bouron objective was important, and it's important that the HLI get it. So yeah, it doesn't. Company on the right of this road, B Company in the fields on the left. So okay, I'm going to drive well, down now to the anti-tank ditch. Yeah, because your your connection's bad there. So we'll we'll bring we'll we'll go so, back to Ben for his bit, and then we'll we'll join you we'll again. Go back to Ben, and I'll at um at Buron at the at the, at the anti-tank ditch. So yeah. um. So Ben, we, where do we leave? The, Duncan is still at Galmanche, and let me know when you want get, uh, Duncan to move off towards his next stop, which will be the the area near Saint Condé. But that, Dun Duncan, what are you looking at now, Duncan? I'm actually looking back to where I started, so I'm looking back towards the forming up point. Right. So the green building in the far distance is where I started, and as you can see, it's a clear line of field here. Yeah. The elevation yeah, yeah. which the Germans are on here. Is several feet. That's all. So that, it is. So several that's, feet. So you're there in Galmanche at those positions facing. So let me bring up the uh, that aerial photo that Ben shared with me. This one there. So you're you're over. You're at the top up here somewhere, aren't you? You're on the top of the photo, or yep. you're you're facing that facing towards there. So you're over here in Gal. So yeah, the, you're you're looking at the open ground. Yep. Yeah, I'm looking at the open ground. I'm looking at the open ground back to where I started now. And, and you say you it's a, a few feet elevation there. It's an elevation of about four feet maximum. That's all it is. And it's just enough to give the Germans the supremacy 
looking back across the starting up point for Charmwood. And obviously they've Coming been hiding their it, trenches yeah, they, into the edges of fields and and, and, and existing um, buildings and tracks and stuff. So so much harder to detect from the air. Oh, absolutely. Very good camouflage here. Very I'll let, I'll let Ben indeed. talk now because Ben's, Ben's, Ben's waiting to say something really exciting now, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's good and it brings home that point as well. Looking at these views, just how open it is, you, you entrench yourself in well-fortified camouflage positions and you with that small uh, height of ground as well, you've got that uh, that advantage. Uh, the direction that Duncan's looking out for us is where you would have seen a squadron moving across from basically right to left position as they push down that western side of Galmonch towards San Contest, where we're going to head to. And then as, if Duncan carries on panning round, that's brilliant. Over to that side is where B Squadron would have uh, been coming round to the edge. Uh, we left it just after eight o'clock. Uh, if Duncan, you wanted to carry on, that's absolutely fine with, with me. Thank you. Uh, uh, eight o'clock, the core command knows that things aren't going to plan at, uh, at Gowant, so they know uh, that around 11 o'clock in the morning, they need to then look of how they're going to address this issue. Report comes in from the East Riding Yeomanry that the infantry there, they're down to the last 50 men uh, that are able to put in an assault and they realise that it's not going to be enough men to take the positions at Galmont with how many Germans are still putting up uh, resistance. So they need to now look to bring in uh, reserves to support them and also looking at bringing uh, a full uh, artillery strike onto the area as well. We've just heard how many guns were available uh, in the area and they were looking for as many as possible to then start to assist with hitting Galmont as well to knock out this. It's effectively a thorn in the side that's sitting in the middle of the advances on the left and right uh, and it needs to be taken. But the initial advance from the South Staff with the support of the East Riding Yeomanry isn't uh, having the desired effect. So, Colin, you are your well, well, you're you're at the anti-tank ditches now, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah give, us, give us your orientation. Show show us Buron and show us back to where you came from, and then I'll show right. you your photo. Well, Buron is right in front of me. There's lots of new houses now, though. Yeah, yeah. Anti-tank were... ditch runs basically. It's so it said uh, where the electricity pipe runs through, and it goes all the way around and curves. As you can see, there's more pylons in the distance going a different direction, and they well, curve down. That's Chiron, isn't it? Over there. That's the towards pylon. Chiron. That curves yeah. down to the Chiron Buron Road, which makes the crossroad. I'll, I'll the show the aerial photo go. now, Colin. Hang on, I'll show yep. that photo. That'll that'll explain it. Right, so for those watching, here we go. So Colin is coming down. Uh, where are we? This road here. So Colin is right here. If you can all see my mouse there. Colin was up here at Villon on This is the road down kind of southeast into Buron here. And as Colin so correctly said, you can see Buron is the intersection of several roads. There's this one there, the east-west one. There's a couple coming out from the south there. So these anti-tank ditches that are typically kind of, um, you know, at an angle like trenches running in here, north-south. So Colin is right there. And, and that's the uh, Villeneuve-Buisson Buron Road. And this over to the left is the uh, Chiron Buron Road. And there's another anti-tank ditch there. And the other day, we walked down here thinking this bit here, if you're following my mouse, was the part of the anti-tank ditch, but it turns out to be on the free war road as well. It's just it's just a farm track, but it may have been the Germans had defenses there as well. And just to look at all the, um, I'll enlarge it there, the pock marks of craters there. Look, obviously this was taken after the battle, um, and you know when Duncan gave us the breakdown of how many, just how many guns were firing at this, you can see the pock marks of all sorts of um, uh, bombard. And I guess over here, do we, is that tank tracks? Do we think, Ben? Hard to say, but uh, there's certainly uh, a lot of vehicles that were involved, whether it's universal carriers as well, moving through the fields. There's that's a lot here. Look good. over here. That's a, yeah. that, that's not far. That's that's all sorts of manoeuvres of, yeah. Um, 
and there's a 1947 map that I haven't got the whether they like the one um, Ben shared of Galmanche of the similar area where they marked out the Allies where the various German positions were. But so, so I'll bring it back to Colin now. And um, so, Colin, um, obviously, there's nothing there of the anti-tank ditch. We thought yeah. we had a look the other day to see if there was. But again, I'm repeating myself stupidly now, but the, just the open ground. So tell us what happened yeah. to the HLI when they got to that area. Right. Well, if you look at the tree line over there, that's the start point. Yeah. You see, it's not that far they've got to cover. And as they are coming down, so I'm on the side of the road that would have had D Company with Major Anderson in command. They're coming down. It's light fire at this stage from the Germans. So we're on the anti-tank ditch. And the Germans are dug in behind it. Now, the landscape has changed because there should be an apple orchard, basically, where I'm looking now. And that's all gone. There's no sign of it. And that is well dug in with machine gun positions. It's the ditch. It's 12 foot across. Varying accounts on how deep it would be. But if it's an anti-tank ditch, it's going to be between six and eight feet minimum. Um, and the men have got to cross that. And it's as they start to cross the trench, that is when it really opens up with the Germans. And one account by one of the men in the regiment said they seem to have an inordinate amount of machine guns, far more than any regiment should have. So obviously it's well dug in, well camouflaged. There's nothing that would sh I can point to that would show you where, the, where it was at this stage. But it's about 40 yards from where we are. So in they come, D Company have got tank, well, they've both got tank support from the 2nd Canadian Armoured, and unfortunately there's a minefield on this side of the anti-tank ditch. And they're now stuck. But that convinced the tank support and B Company on the other side of the road that they were also in a minefield, so they have stuck. The problem the infantry have got now is they're going in naked. They have no support here. And in they went, and as they're trying to get out the ditches, they are being wiped out by machine gun fire. Moving in towards the orchard with T Company, by the time they get there, they've got the remnants of two platoons. That's it. It's not even enough to have a full platoon between the two of them. One of the sections led by Corporal Weitzel, he's got two men from his section. That's it, there's three of them. Noticing two MG positions, probably 34s, but they might have been 42s, who knows. They charged them. They just open charged these two positions. Two men from the section were killed immediately. Weitzel was wounded, but he still carried in the attack and he silenced the two machine guns and then died of his wounds immediately. They're struggling on that side as well, but the casualties are slightly less. The major blow of casualties will come on this side of the road. Uh, Sergeant Henshaw, or Henshafer, I can't rightly remember, he is going to organise what he's got and that orchard will be cleared. As they move through, Anderson brings the rest in from the anti-tank ditch and they attack into the town. They're the first troops into the town. Coming in, we now have B Company making progress. They're, being, they're hindered slightly because they've actually taken 20 German POWs and they've got to deal with them first. Now, the attack has caused so many casualties. C Company has been sent in and they're going to attack straight down the main road and into the centre of town. And when they get into town, they're going to swing around to the right and take up a position on the front of Buron with D Company resting behind them. But because of the problems, A Company, which is in reserve, they're going to now be sent in and they will come straight down the main road as well, swinging to the left and take up a position in front of B Company. So we've got used all four companies to secure this town. By 11.30, it is pretty much secure. However, there's been so many casualties amongst signalers, runners, I haven't to run around to locate senior commanders from the four companies, because not all have their company commander left with them, and they are brought in. And that is when we establish the strength of the companies that are left in the town of Buran when it's been cleared. D Company, which led the way, have got 39 men alive. That's it. That's all they've got fit to fight in the town. Wow. B Company are down to 30% strength. C Company, which joins the battle later, they've lost 50% of troops. 
A company, which was the reserve company, which wasn't supposed to be used, they've come into the battle and they've had 40% losses. So there's not much left of this battalion. There's certainly not a great deal of strength left. D Company will actually be taken out of the line later in the day when the left out of battles troops are brought in to take their positions because they're just not strong enough to hold anything. And now the town quietens down. It will get lively again in the afternoon, but I'll do that from inside the town, Paul. Yeah. Because yeah. that's where I'm going to head next, is into the centre uh, of the and, town. And, and Nick, Nick, Mr. MG42 Bad is watching and commenting. He said, because when you talk about the machine guns there in Buron, the Panzer Grenadier sections had two light machine guns per section compared to ve uh, uh, regular infantry. So that may explain right, the, number that explains of, the extra why number of German machine guns yeah. they're facing there. Um, well, Frank, and I'm sure Frank I mean I'm, I'm that. grateful that we're talking about the HL, HLI because I'm sure most people watching this program have not read about much about the HLI, nor have they read much about the East Riding Yeomanry or the 59th Staffordshire Division. We're we you know we're putting a spotlight on some different units. Yes, I'm doing stuff on Americans and the 101st and 29th, but I love as a as the relative of a third div guy to talk about these these other units that are battling through this insanely awful countryside here. Uh, north of course so i'll let you drive on colin we'll bring duncan in and ben in again duncan's got some stuff he wants to say as well so we'll let you drive on into beer on now okay. colin. and so Speak stuff, perfect stuff thank you so um duncan has now moved to uh, a field just to the side of San Conte or San Contest, I'll say it the English way. So I'll share that map again. So Duncan has come from Galmanche here. He's now pushing, you know, following this hour down to sort of San Contest. And he's on a road between between this main road coming down. If you follow it there, that's the main road. Duncan turned off here and I think in Malon and is going on a road kind of east to west. And he's about where the M is there of Malon. And San Conte is over there. So that's where Duncan is. So Duncan, explain your ground to us. Well, there obviously we can see this. There's the hospital. So you're obviously looking south towards Shoe there. Yep. You might put your mic. Absolutely. Down. Yep. yep. I'm on there. Swing around and show us back towards uh, where you came from. And again, you know, I, I am, I'm repeating myself, but, you know, it has to be said, just open bloody wheat fields of killing ground. Although that one behind you there, of course, has, um, is that a hedge or is that, is that, is that maize? That's maize. Yeah. That's, there would have been maize. no maize back in World War II, of course. So, well, ben, I just, so ben, I just want the, in, sorry, I just want, I just want the viewers to imagine the following that has been dropped out of the sky onto this area that I'm looking at here. And yeah. that was, 100,825 pounder shells, 42,105 millimeter shells, 32,005.56, 1,600, 155 millimeter, and 7.2 uh, inch rounds, giving a total of 176,800 artillery rounds dropped into this area that I'm panning now. And yet, as Ben said, there are still Germans able to pop up and knock out tanks. There are still Germans able to take out. I mean, it's incredible, isn't it? That that weight of that big war we have is still unable to actually shift Germans. It comes down to men with pig sticker bayonets walking across fields and tanks with commanders bravely no, uh, head and shoulders out of the turrets there, just edging across those fields, hoping for best uh, of the best until they can see targets that they can't see because of dust anyway. So Ben, let's bring um, the East Riding Yeomanry in, in, in again. So the San Conte battle. So Galmanche was a problem. What's happening here in San Conte? Yes, you could say for the uh, first and seventh battalion of the Royal Warwickshire and for a squadron that would move down with them, this was a more successful phase. Uh, the actual orders of the operation were broken down into different phases. And this was phase two uh, that would be around half past seven in the morning uh, that the Royal Warwicks would push on and move to take the uh, the village of San Contest. And we've got this, this great photo here uh, that uh, was roughly probably around that time, half past seven in the morning. There's also IWN uh, video footage of them moving off across these fields as well. You can see uh, in the distance the, the church 
it does look as though it has sustained damage. The front uh, front of it has been uh, blown away. If you were to go and visit today, you'll see how it's been uh, repaired. Well, Duncan's taking us down the damage of that later on, so we'll do all that later. And again, the, the spire, you can see the top half of the, the spire uh, missing as well. But you've got here the Royal Warwick sat uh, waiting to move off at around half past seven to make their move into the village. They do that. And it's at around 8.45 that uh, reports are coming in via the East Riding Yeomanry that the Warwicks are successfully pushing into San Contest and are about 100 yards into the village. And they're not meeting a huge amount of resistance compared to what we've heard about uh, further behind them uh, at Galmont, so they're able to start pushing through. The tanks of A Squadron managed to manoeuvre into a depression uh, in, the, in the ground on the northern side of the, uh, the village, which allows them to get into a hull down position. And it's recorded that they were then able to have a shoot and, and support the infantry as they moved through San Contest. And it was a good position for them where they didn't take uh, any casualties or losses of tanks themselves. They did receive incoming fire, but nothing that did uh, or would worry them that day. I'm just spitballing here now, um, Ben, but do we wonder, because the dust was a problem for the British, we conclude the dust must have been a problem for the Germans as well. So I'm guessing as we move, as, we, as we've got through further south, I'm assuming we are now in an area where the Germans can't correct their artillery that easily because they can't see either. If they're, they're losing forward observers, maybe we've now got beyond the, the particularly dangerous bit because we've just moved ahead of where their guns are firing. And that might explain why this area is, is, is a little bit quieter than the area slightly north. I'm, I'm just kind of spitballing there. What do you think? Yeah, it, and it's a good point to, to raise those initial opening phases back at Galmont from half four till around six in the morning. You'd still got that morning mist. Uh, the Germans are allowed uh, allow the British to come right onto them before they're opening up to mask their positions with the assistance of the smoke and the mist, uh, which then hampers any British artillery getting involved or, or the tanks being able to shoot. But here, a few hours later uh, at San Contest, no doubt the mist would have uh, uh, risen by then and disappeared. Yeah, there may be smoke and dust from the the previous. Uh, artillery barrages or overnight bombings but uh, it's more clear especially for the East Rhine A squadron that they're able to see targets and assist the infantry uh, at this point where back at Galmont the the tanks couldn't do that. I'm just bringing in Colin now but Colin's now in the middle in Buron he's now on the Buron Chiron road which actually is the Concrete road and there's there's a house there that is absolutely mullered with um, spang holes on it and we we uh and as you can see gradually over the years even if you compare some of the old heimdall books from 20 years ago you go there now and buildings have been re-rendered and refaced and you can't blame the french for you know improving their properties but that pro problem that house there number 40 is still absolutely pl plastered with holes there so that's facing you're facing north aren't you there colin is that right yes i'm facing that's the north side of the road yeah yeah. And I'll just yeah, share a photo. It's actually taken further west, but there's a photo of a, um, a Canadian uh, Sherman tank coming through Buron. For those who follow me on Twitter, I, I did a then and now of this photo a couple of days ago. Go back on my Twitter feed. You'll find it. It's beyond where we can kind of get to on this tour. It's yeah. a bit further down the road. But that is a, a, a Sherman coming through Buron on, on July the 8th. Uh, but that area there, the bullet holes there, and you can see, you can see it's Colin's show. This area... Well, explain, Colin, that had been sitting in no man's land, hadn't it, Buron, for a month? Yes, yes. It's because uh, the Germans are shelling from the rear and they're going to shell the town in the afternoon. Uh, and the shelling is going to come from that direction. So from the east. And they're going to give it an almighty stonk in the afternoon. And the Canadians hadn't really dug in too well by that stage. And, of course, more casualties are going to be taken because of that. Following on from the artillery stonk, they then sent in the armour. Now, depends which report you read, you know what it's like with Tigers, but eight armoured vehicles definitely approach the B Company area, which is down beyond the traffic lights. And But the 
the second armoured, Canadian second armoured, had managed to push through with vehicles then, and SPGs accounted for six of the German vehicles, and the other two backed out of the fight. And then it goes very quiet for the occupants of Buron. And the Canadians will manage to dig in. They move the companies around. So C Company is now going to go out and take up a position to the south of town overlooking OT, where they'd been a month earlier. They'd been in position in that village. But now they're moving down there. And we're going to walk up and I'm going to eventually end up at the memorial to the casualties of the Highland Light Infantry. Uh, well, there's a few uh, things you're going to show us around there, aren't we? We'll come back to you. And, you know, there's lots of stuff to see around there in Buron, which you'll show us, which we're, we're grateful for. Yeah, and, some um, lovely memorials. And it's in interesting, those with... watching this, you know, we're obviously people like, you know, me, Ben, Colin, Doug, we've been reading Mark Zelke and John Buckley and Mike Bechtold. And, and of course, all the accounts vary. I mean, the war diaries, the HLI say eight tigers. Some books say Good. nine panthers. Some say they were knocked out by 17 pounders. Some they were say they were knocked out by 105 priests. So, you know, you're into that that mystery of comparing war diaries and and, and well, the this, official you know, war diary you know. does say eight tigers. I, I think it's unlikely myself. But, I, I um, agree that it's unlikely. More. But show us in because that's that's little there's little weird little bumpy bit of ground there in Buran. And we and we have to confess is even when we had, when we did our recce a few days, this is the first time me Connor Duncan had been to this bit. We kind of not we just you know you although we live in Normandy we do different because things and there's the main memorial where we take our customers too is at the back of this park so we don't come through the park at all really and we notice there's a mistake on the money you'll show us the monument in a minute but there's a mistake on it because it refers to well i'll let you explain it because you, you you can read the monument to us colin well it says jack anderson and it's just there i don't know if you can get the thing in there padre highland light infantry so it's either an error because it should be jack anderson who's the major who commanded D Company, or it is actually to the Padre who gave the speech on the landing crafts coming in. Yeah, there's a bit of a mix up there with who's who, but Colonel Colonel Anderson was not a Padre, was he? Uh, he was definitely no. an infant. So there's a bit of a. a, a but then, yeah, we, we found that monument for the first time. Have you seen that one before, Ben? No. It's a, uh, we, we, you know, loved it. And there's another one you was calling to show us to, um, yeah. to Radley Walters in a minute, which yeah, is. Yeah, he's just up here. And then I'll come back to Duncan and Ben in a minute. But while, while you're showing us this stuff, and again, for those watching, you know, this is what we're trying to do at World War II TV, bringing these events to the day, walking you around these sites, giving you live footage, live commentary about what you know, happened in, in, in these very locations uh, 76 years ago. So um, it's all cool stuff. And, and we enjoy making these films and hope, hopefully you enjoy watching them. So there's a monument there to Radley Walters. So um, the park well, was park. actually named after him. So Brigadier General Sherbrooke Fusiliers. And he comes in, for those watching who are aware of that rather, fa I don't want to say his name, the German tank commander that we have to had to mention at Villa Bocage, who was killed on August the 8th, south of uh, Car uh, Sinfo. Radley Walters is on the, uh, the, the west side of the road, and then you have the British uh, Northamptonshire Yeomanry on the uh, east side of the road. And this, this is the Operation Total Eyes, when Michael... I don't like saying his name, Michael Bittman gets knocked out, but Radley Walters was in command of the 27th Armoured Brigade then, and his yeah. unit were certainly engaging fire with some Germans. Yes, um, he was. Yes, this is a support group, basically. There's a memorial to the Sherbrooks. Um, and he was... He was famous right on the Stephen Ambrose tours in the 80s with people like Major Howard and uh, Hans von mm -hmm. Luch coming and trading stories. So he, he became quite a famous veteran there. But I'll let you walk around back uh, you're going to walk back to the other monument now, Colin. So I'll come, come back to you in a couple of minutes, okay? Give me a memorial, so I'll see you in a couple of minutes. So, Duncan and and um, and Ben, so um, where, you're still at the lay-by, Duncan, yeah? I think you should move on to the church now, I reckon, I reckon, Duncan, and then we'll let Ben yep. sum up the events for the <clears throat> East Riding Yeomanry. Okay. Absolutely, and, um, so I'm going to move on, yep. Yep, so... Um, so Ben, let's because we've got you know half an hour to play with now. So um, we the, the San Conte fire, fighting was not as heavy as had been up in Galmanche. So what was happening? What time of day are we at now with the East Riding Yeomanry? So yeah, if we at the minute if we stay with San Contest uh, at around eleven thirty, uh, the reports continue to come in. Although a squadron are sat on the outskirts north of the the village looking in, uh, they. 
know that the Royal Warwick shares are now pushing well into the uh, the village to take it and buy. Uh, it's about four o'clock in the afternoon. The report comes in that the village has been taken successfully. Uh, the A Squadron, there's this is where sometimes the war diaries get a bit ambiguous and bits are missed out but there's reports to say from the Warwickshire side that the East Riding tanks went off and set after uh, a group of German tanks that were seen on the southern part of uh, San Contest uh, south uh, and as they uh, they did that the German tanks withdrew uh, towards the the city uh, there's no reports in the East Riding Yeomanry diaries of that taking place, although in the infantry diaries uh, they have put in this action of the tanks uh, engaging and uh, repelling this, this attack from uh, the German armour. Again, it was said, I think eight tanks were reported, but from the East Riding point of view, it's not recorded uh, in there directly. And we've just got Duncan coming to the uh, the church now, just pulling up for us. But the as said, the village is taken by uh, four o'clock in the afternoon, uh, and it is in British hands. Uh, and the Warwicks have completed and hold consolidate their task for uh, Operation Charmwood. So I think I think Duncan, show us the church first. Then we'll we'll do the we'll do the monument in a minute. I think maybe I, I'm just deciding. Um, so this is the church that was in that photo that we showed earlier on, and um, Duncan will go and show us the bullet holes there. While we're, while Duncan's walking up, I'll bring in Colin again. So Colin is now back um, in in Biron. So there's the monument. Well, I'll let you explain the monuments, Colin. So there's there's three well, there, aren't there? There are three, and this one is <clears throat> excuse me for the Sherbrooke Fusiliers, which of course is the support and armour that would come through. And I'll just give you the English version. I'll try and get up close without standing on any flowers. There you go. You can read that. Yeah, a monument man. erected to um, everlasting memory of those who give their lives and to the honour of all who served the cause of freedom with this regiment recruited from the city of Sherbrooke, Quebec, Canada. So that's that one. And then we have the, one of the HLI monuments. And there... You can see, dedicated 1969 to honour the men who served with the Highland Light Infantry of Canada in World War II. To all were amongst the first Allied troops to enter Con. The HLI, sorry, were amongst the first Allied troops to enter Con following the Normandy landing June 6, 1944. And, so the, and these are these are pretty much have... properly Scots, aren't they? I mean, they're Canadian yeah, by national, yeah. but they're they're first or second generation Scots, so they're, yes. they're they really are properly just as Scottish as some of the higher divisions coming from the north, uh, you know, from from Britain. Indeed, uh, indeed. And then they're, we they're, have they're... the Battle of Buron Memorial, which is right there. And that's new. That's 2018. This that's is... even there two years. I can't see a date. I think it said 2018. I said, if you, if, uh, I remember that from a couple of days ago. Maybe it didn't. Maybe I'm imagining yeah. it wrong. Well, you can see. I'll read it for you. Yeah, your bandwidth is weird now again, Colin. Damn. We can't hear you, Colin. Uh, 8th of July, 44. Soldiers of the HLI of Canada. 9th Brigade, 3rd Division, assaulted the German towns of Buron, supported by the Sherbrooke Fusiliers. Brilliant. Connection well, in Buron's pretty bad. Um, that battalion suffered 260. We're, we're, we're losing your audio, Colin. We'll, we'll, we'll try and get you in when you're a bit better on some like It's bad, like bad bandwidth again there. It is, yeah. But I'll I just leave it well, perhaps if, you move, and... if you move on to Combon Play now, and you can do the summary perhaps there, if you if we can't get your audio there, we'll we'll we'll, we'll switch back to Duncan now. And okay, I'll head for Com. Yeah, although we, although you're okay now, bizarrely you're okay. Say something. Well, maybe again. I was just too close to the memorials, and um, but the new memorial does give you the number of casualties. On that battalion of HLI of Canada suffered 262 casualties on the 8th of July in the taking of this town. Now, C companies, I've said, have moved out. 
So they've gone down that road to Hilly to sit on top of that and look down on OT. Um, it was a quite a peaceful night for them. They didn't get any shelling during the night, um, but it was a stand too for the entire evening. Uh, the carriers and jeeps came in, taking out the casualties and taking out D Company, which was so under strength, they just could not be left in the line. Uh, there is a counter-attack that's going to form up but fail, ultimately. Uh, and the left out of battles will suffer some casualties, but not many, from that counter-attack, which is quickly, quick, pretty quickly repulsed. And that is the end of, basically, World War II for Buron. Yeah. Um, other than when we drop bombs in the wrong place. Well, I'll let you, um, I'll let you move on to Convon Plain story. to finish things up because you've got about five yeah, minutes. Right so I'll let you move on and I'll, I'll, I'll switch to Duncan and Ben again. So thanks for that, Colin. It was all brilliant stuff. So um, so I'll, we'll speak to you again in a few minutes, Colin. Okay. I'll speak to you later. So, Dun well, obviously, th this is the church at, at saint Conte with Duncan. We walked around this a couple of days ago and it's absolutely, um, you know, pe peppered with shrapnel rounds are you, which, are you around the back of the church duncan where we kind of thought there was that those bren gun or sten gun burst have you got there yet i'm just going right now yeah see for those watching it's almost like we rehearsed this isn't it because we did rehearse it that's why um what 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 ben what did the uh any of the veterans you've spoken to do they remember the village of san conte being destroyed do they remember the the the, the you know the, the fighting there it's, it's um, the, the, uh, the two East Riding Yeomanry veterans that are still with us were both V, v Squadron, so they were up at uh, Galmonch. Uh, so I haven't spoken to anyone that was actually uh, in San Contest itself. But there, I mean, it's absolutely just peppered, and I, you know, I'm encouraging people. That's another one. That is we, another we, stain gun run there. Yeah, we hope that brilliant. those watching it, that they're, though, although you're enjoying our videos, you hope we also hope that this is making you want to come and see some of these lesser places of yourselves. I mean, there's, as Ben can attest to, there's nothing like actually walking these areas yourself and looking at it and you know putting your fingers against the wall and feeling that feeling the history there. Um, I know obviously people can't always travel, and that's why we're trying. For those who can't travel, we're hoping to bring Normandy to your living room. And there's there's some nice that that burst there, right in the middle of the picture there. We reckon that was either a Sten gun burst or a, or a Bren gun burst. There, the spacing is is consistent with you know, a couple of bursts, three three round bursts. There's one one burst there. There's a another burst over the right, but that would kind of be typical. Of, um, you know, Duncan's our infantryman there. Three round burst. That's normal, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And um, then you'll take us back to the monument in a minute. And yeah, when you come to Normandy, just spend some more time, walk around these places, feel it. And um, so, so we'll we're, um, we'll let Duncan ha head on back to the monument now. And Don Collins on his way to Combon Plain, where we'll, we'll bring things up. What um, what what points do you want to make now, Ben? Because we've got you know another fifteen minutes or so to play with. Yeah, ju just with with San Contest. Uh say it, it's taken it's captured at around four o'clock in the afternoon there are reports of sporadic machine gun fire small arms fire still uh every now and again within the village but the uh it's it's in our control now at around eight o'clock uh, a squadron withdraw and go back to their harbour area so the royal warwickshire uh, that are in the the town their armed support has uh, withdrawn for that time uh, being but yeah it's you can clearly see the the amount of battle damage just on the church alone no doubt if you walk the village uh, and see some of the older buildings you you'll see consistent with what we're seeing here as well the the scars from i mean there, there's some i mean gone. because places like buran and saint conte and combon plain that is the absolute middle of commuter belt for con now so you've got lots of people moving in there now in their 30s and 40s and younger and so buildings are being improved and we're not going to knock anybody for restoring their buildings and things so it's only the churches and the kind of the very old farmers where you really consistently see the damage these days. And, you know, because so much of it has been rebuilt, as Colin said, Buron was, you know, in the middle of the firing line for the best part of a month. So you have to be a bit persistent to find the bullet hole. It's like corn tomorrow. We're, we're, it's, it's because we're bringing in people like Gwen, who lives there, who's found some really cool bullet holes and damage that we're going to be showing you tomorrow in, in part two of this uh, presentation. 
Um, oh, Ben, let's do a little summary of what was happening to the British, the third division, the British and, and Lebesy Wood. As we, I know we're not really focusing on that, but I'll yes. bring the map up and just do a little summary of, of how their day has been going, if you wouldn't mind. Yep, that's fine. I'll just wait for the, the map to come on. So we're over on the, the eastern side now. Uh, their, their positions uh, starting off just north of Lebesy. Uh, for those who have been and, and seen the area now, uh, the starting off positions are around where the golf course uh, now is uh, in Beeville, down that direction. Uh, again, the area uh, just beyond Lebise is hit by the initial bombing raids uh, on the night of the 7th, early hours of, of the 8th. And if you, you look back, take the time to look at the Imperial War Museum collection of the photos, there are a lot for this area. And you can really see the devastation that this bombing raid has caused. Uh, it's a lot different to where we've just been out in these fields. The, the roads into Khan, uh, and it's referenced in the, the photo catalogue, and it's compared to a Somme landscape in numerous times uh, with the amount of devastation that's been caused. Uh, moving on from uh, from Lebise, you had the King Shropshire Light Infantry that have moved up into the small village. Uh, uh, Duncan's just shown as the 59th Staffordshire Division uh, Memorial, which is a cracking monument. I mean, it's it, we 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 had a look at that lump of stone. It's obviously been brought in from a, from a, an old farm, or so it wasn't actually there on that location. And they've put the monument there to the division, and they've also had the the, the full color images of the cat badges there, which is just beautiful. We think it's part of a part of the church, possibly that building. They moved it across. So you got the Royal Norfolk there, and uh, uh, the 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 Royal Army Med Medical Corps, the North Staff, South Staffs, War Artillery, all there. It's a lovely, lovely monument. Um, but I'll let you finish off about the third division, we'll, and then Duncan will give us the 59th division um, kind of summary of that, um, because as you said, Ben, this was kind of their first first day in uh, at war really and um yes, we're not that we're going to say they underperformed they just hadn't they hadn't acquired the skills that the divisions like the british third and the canadian third had over the previous weeks and the british third and 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 canadian third had had problems on the first couple of days so the, it's just that on by comparison the 59th division now seem to be accomplishing less because they're now being measured against the two divisions to their to their to their side who have got better at their job so it's not that they're bad it's that the others have got better i think is um yeah so um yeah just do you want to just give us a quick rundown of the of the uh, 59th division casualties duncan did you did you have that in your head before you go off to combon plane or are you driving off you go off then duncan i don't mind whatever um no, he's driving off. That's so, just, yeah, ju just to finish off on that, uh, the left and flank of the third division push in towards towards Calm. Uh, the King Shropshire Light like Infantry moving up into Labise, that hill sixty four, uh, just to the northeast of Epron Labiju area. They're holding that position uh, to the left hand side, probably mirroring the Calm Canal. Uh, Again, it's the second battalion of the Royal Warwickshire that were coming down towards the area of uh, Colombales, the uh, the factory, the opposite side, and then pushing through the middle off the top of my head. I'm sure the photos that I'd seen recently with the King's Own Scottish borders, I believe. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm just showing the aerial photo that I I, I yes. borrowed from Sean Coldicott on the Twitter today. <laughs> uh, the show is point sixty four that has now yeah. effectively been completely swallowed up by the city of Caen. Um, so the Lebesy Wood is, is well, it's not just the wood; it's fields as well. It's all that area has changed so much now, which is yeah. why we're focusing on the area to the uh, to the to the west because um, you know there's just not so much to see in that area there. Although we will devote some time tomorrow to the third division. Um, but yeah, so I'll, let, I'll put it back to you, uh, Ben. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, ju just to finish off with that push straight down uh, into the middle of Calm, which you're going to pick on to tomorrow with the no doubt the photos and the route that they're pushing into the the northern fringes of Calm towards uh, the uh, chateau in the middle, uh, Saint Pierre. And th this is where you can really see the devastation. Um, we spoke about the, the bombings at the start, preliminary bombings, and that if it was a quicker advance than what it was for certain uh, divisions, 
you would have found their armoured support would have not been able to navigate through Khan itself uh, because of the destruction, the buildings that had collapsed, the roads were impassable and uh, some of the East Riding Yeomanry men were able to, uh, after the 8th of, uh, sorry, after the 9th of July, when they were withdrawn from the, the front, uh, they had time to go and actually visit Khan. And some of them have recorded and said how much devastation there were and that why did they want to send tanks into Khan? Because we would never have been able to navigate through the roads. Well, yeah, and we'll talk about that tomorrow because... Um, uh we have to kind of miss out the beginning part of July the 9th because that suburb bit of course has changed so dramatically there's not much to match up so we kind of leave it today two or three clicks north of Corn, then pick up tomorrow right in the center of Corn, missing out kind of the middle part of the story simply because it's all just industrial well not industrial but kind of modern com commercial buildings um, modern apartments and there's nothing to really see there so it will but we've got lots of good stuff to bring you tomorrow we're very excited we had a, we enjoyed our recce today and um, the, the 59th Division, uh, of course, um, Ben, they don't have a very long history, do they? They, uh, they, get, they get disbanded in August. So what was the story there for our audience? Yeah, but the, uh, well, one of the reasons for that example is the uh, North Staffordshires that are fighting at Gallimunch on their real first outed out that are pretty much uh, destroyed straight out on the, the 8th of July. Uh the exact numbers for the uh, second and sixth, I don't have the numbers of how many men they'd lost, but it, as I said, it was recorded that they were down to 50 men quite early on around midday on the 8th of July already. Uh, so taking big losses from, from this uh, itself. Yeah, and I mean, it should be pointed out though the division was disbanded, the, the the men were taken off and became replacements to other to other units. It's not that they, you know, the, the, the men themselves just disappeared. They were just uh, put into other units that have been suffering horrendous loss. I don't know which particular units got the um got got them got the men from the 59th, whether it was the 43rd Wessex or the 49th. I don't know where they went, but they those that had survived were were just funneled in to be replacements because the Normandy campaign, as we always are saying in his films, was very costly. I mean. Uh, it, it's, a, it's not so much a meat grinder, but every yard we move, we lose people. And, and the British haven't got, and the Canadians haven't got the strength in depth that the, the Americans have. They can kind of thrust in a new division and, and still have plenty of spare divisions. We just don't have that strength to, to, to do that. So um, it is, um, it's important. So our, our, two, our two roving reporters are heading on to our final place. In fact, Duncan is, is already there. Colin is is um, I think I don't know where Colin is quite yet, but Duncan is rolling into Combon Plain. The field opposite the uh, the cemetery, uh, Ben, was the um, was the dressing station. Is that right? Yes. Uh, and just to finish off with the sorry, actions yeah. uh, uh, at Cam, uh, sorry, uh, at Galmonch, uh, it's around five o'clock in the afternoon that they put in the reserves to try and uh, assist the South Staff so that their attacks failed. Uh, it's clearly not going to plan. The uh, reserves come in and then they pretty much run into the same problem again. There's uh, well camouflaged hidden Germans still within these positions that they just cannot dislodge. Uh, at around eight o'clock at night, B squadron are then withdrawn from the area and then the infantry uh, consolidate what they have got but they're going to have to carry on their assault on Gallimont the following day, especially the chateau that uh, was still well in German hands, believed to be just under 100 uh, men in the chateau grounds uh, itself. But the uh, field that's opposite the cemetery in Cams, that was the uh, dressing station and an aid post uh, across. If we can go to that. I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll just want to show to people where we are. We've moved back to beyond the start line now because the cemetery is is back north again, a Combon Plain, and that's where the Royal Oster Rifles that we'll be talking about tomorrow uh, had been for a month. We'll bring their story in in, in tomorrow's show, but th that's Duncan's view now. So that was the, that was the dressing station there in Combon Plain. And um, I think Colin is rolling in there as well very shortly. So, yeah. um, and there's some barbed wire pickets in that fence. There's some original barbed. We saw one of them, uh, Duncan's re reacting. Two or three of them weren't, weren't genuine, but there was one we found there that we thought was a genuine World War II one. 
although we've now earmarked it now someone watching this will come then dig it out you know but and then we'll get then both guys will finish at the cemetery i think ben's got some things he wants to say about the cemetery and and, and duncan will and we and men from apart from the canadians there's men from the 59th and the third division in that, that one there we thought looked like it could be a, is that the one we thought was right duncan or was it the one further right one of them we thought looked it was looked genuine didn't we and it wasn't till uh, anyway. probably three three years ago we, we visited the cemetery before we parked up and it wasn't till uh, I'd started uh, working with Alan King, working on his memoirs that uh, we, we started to really get stuck into the detail and this is where this field came to light. Right. Uh, Alan with B Squadron uh, during the afternoon uh, down at, uh, at CAMS, uh, they were on the northern eastern edge and it was then in the afternoon that his tank commander Corporal Wilkes, similar to uh, Major Platts, had his head out of the turret uh, and he was hit. He fell back into the, the tank turret and Alan immediately was able to realise what was going on and he grabbed hold of his tank commander Louis Wilkes. Uh, straight away he got some uh, dressing out and held it to his head seeing the wound to his head and Alan began to scream at uh, the the driver telling him to withdraw from the area to head back away from the fire the incoming fire at, at Galmonch. Uh, Alan was shouting left stick down right stick just trying to get the tank away from that area so they could then withdraw and get some uh, aid first aid treatment for Corporal Wilkes and it was then they came back to the the aid post that's the field just opposite the uh, the cemetery. Alan recalls that as soon as they stopped uh, medics were there and climbed up onto the tank and Alan helped pass Corporal Wilkes out through the uh, uh, the hatch uh, and it was at that point that the medics immediately took one look at Corporal Wilkes uh, and shook their heads and told them uh, that, that he'd gone. And Alan recalls in that field as well, he could remember seeing German prisoners of war that were digging small uh, slit trenches. And it was there that Corporal Wilkes was placed into one of those uh, and buried in as you stood at that gate that we were at a minute ago it's up in the far right corner that was corporal wilkes's original uh, burial wow. grave in that field before being reinterred in the cemetery where we're going to go into well and um yeah and it's a beautiful cemetery and um they're both guys are there you know our camera teams have, have merged oh. now so um that's i nice. just want to can i just give you some figures they say by can. six o'clock on the 11th of july uh, the 59th had 239 killed and 1,090 wounded or missing. Other units as follows. The 1st, 7th Warwickshire, officers 10, other ranks 133. The 7 Norfolks, 10 officers, 142 other ranks. 2nd, uh, 5th Lancashire, Fusiliers, 9 officers, 123 other ranks. The 5th Lancashire, 51 other ranks and the second six Staffordshire 16 officers and 199 other ranks wow so yeah grisly reading yeah it is and for those watching I mean I think you know and even us tour guides we sometimes overlook the battle of Caen a little bit and just oh it was taken on July the 9th the 9th and mm. the, the, the losses according to the the, the general consensus is the, and then we had some questions about the, about the, the forces involved. So the Germans had um, elements of one infantry division and elements of one armor division, and then some and about sixty tanks on July the eighth. The British we have three infantry divisions supported by three armored brigades and and all the consequent tanks of that and armored vehicles and self propelled guns. At the end of July the eighth and ninth, the British have lost in the region of eighty, maybe ninety tanks. The Germans, well, who knows, 20, 30 tanks, something like that. British casualties on this day were in the region of 4,000 men killed or wounded. 
Um, and it could be more than that. Uh, German, who knows, maybe 2,000 casualties, killed and wounded. And then, of course, French civilians, which Ben mentioned this morning, several hundred um, for, for just a, you know, one well, two-day battle. But the main, the main kind of fighting was on July the 8th. Tomorrow, is, is, there's some fighting, but it's more of a, um, a, 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 not, a not quite a mopping up. That's not doing, being, doing justice to the, the losses on June the 9th, or July the 9th. But the July the 8th was the, the big day. And there is, there is the Combon Plain, um, Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery. How many, how many are buried there, Duncan? I forget the figure. Right. So the figures are, there's a bit of a surprise that I want to bring you tonight. This is a first on World War II TV. They make the claim there's 123 named laid to rest in this cemetery. And also there are one of the unknown. Right. But it is actually 125. May I share the story with you? Yes, you learned it this afternoon, didn't you? We, we're, we're very impressed, Duncan. Well done. We love you. <laughs> yes, okay. Dan Robertson. I don't. 59th, 59th Division. Okay, South Staffordshire Regiment. Here... Let me give you as a lovely photograph of him. Let me just give you that. There you go. Right. Can you all see that? There he is yeah, there. We can. There he is. Now, he lost two of his best buddies in Charmwood, okay, which was a, da a Jack Timsey and a Jimmy Nor uh, Norman, okay? Now, all the guys in his platoon looked up to him because he was 23 years old. He was the oldest in his platoon. The others averaged 18 years old and he lost these guys and believe it or not they are still missing in action one minute they were there the next minute they were gone and he went home and he started coming back here in 1951 with his family and his buddies to remember these guys here okay now unfortunately in 1998 he died at the ripe old age of 77 now, his family, I've got a photograph of him before he passed away. It's very, very pixelated. I stole it this afternoon, so bear with me. We're bearing with you. Yeah, can you see that? There he is, yeah. just before he passed away, okay? And um, his family went to the, uh, the War Graves Commission, and they said, can we have him laid to rest with his buddies in here? He's come back every year. And they got the mayor involved. And uh, unfortunately, it wasn't going to happen. So the family took the law into their own hands and his ashes have been buried in a cemetery. Yeah. So we now have 125. So what I'd like to do, I came this afternoon and did a little recce and I've worked out where he is actually laid to rest. Well, his ashes. And Ben, your guy is just down here. Uh, um, there you go. Wilkes. Is the, is the photo is. still yeah. still there? Is you it? go. Of course, course it is, you buddy. Put that photo yeah. there, Ben. Are you and Alan put that there, did you? Uh, uh, last year with Alan King, we we placed that there, uh, and then the Commonwealth War Graves kindly uh, visited him because we were unable to to attend this year so far. They they placed that uh, green marker there for us uh, on behalf of Alan uh, on the sixth of June, but. Alan, uh, several times a year, returns back to visit his friend, uh, the man that he's never forgotten, uh, Corporal Louis Wilkes. Uh, and we, we'd stood at the grave many, many times and we'd discussed his family. We knew that he was married. He'd got two young children uh, and his wife had emigrated to Canada. And we wondered whether the family ever visited or did they, uh, did they know much about it? Uh, of what happened to to their family member. And it was a few years ago that out of the blue, uh, I received an email from uh, uh, a Mr. Kevin Wilkes, uh, and it, it was his, uh, Louis, Louis Wilkes's grandson, making contact with us and were able to reunite Alan with the Wilkes family uh, so they could meet up and, and fill that gap in that family history. And from my point of view, it's, it's like, similar to yourselves, this is why we do this. We, we research the history and we give this closure and reunite these families. Uh, and yeah, it was, it was a privilege to help Alan and the Wilkes family reunite and then they can both come back and pay respects 
uh, to Corporal Wilkes. And we, we think Alan is possibly watching tonight as well, don't we? So that'd be really nice. Yeah. If you are watching, hello, Alan. We're, we haven't forgotten. We will bring you on the show or a show for an interview at some point. We're still working that one out. But um, I mean, as, as we always say with the Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery, and there are 2,000 or so of them around the world, they're always immaculate. The gardeners were there just a couple of days ago. I mean, you know, it, it is to, to, you know, pardon the, the use of a well used phrase, it is a corner of a foreign field. It's always. They're always immaculate and flowers and poppies and carnations and 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 just beautiful. And um, this year, of course, a lot less visitors. Um, but the, the Commonwealth War Graves are still out. They're still doing their work. They're still cutting the grass and looking after everything. So when visitors can start coming, it's Europeans are now here again. There are there are plenty of French and Dutch and Germans and things there. But the Brit Brits will be here soon, I think. And Americans, who knows when they'll be here? And again, if the Americans are watching this, please, you know, venture into British sector. There's lots to see beyond just Pegasus Bridge and the famous sites. There's all these incredible, incredible sites. And Combon Plain, I always reminds me now of a very kind of sub suburban British kind of Isha, Surbiton, Surrey kind of place. It's very leafy and green. And because it's the commuter belt for coin, it's very hard when you're driving through it now to imagine some of the, the devastation that took place there and the reconstruction, the losses. And uh, we've had some comments about the casualty figures we quoted. Yeah, I, can, I quoted some very conservative figures. If you start adding up the third div accounts and Mark Zelke from what he wrote about breakout from Juno and, you know, who knows how many casualties actually are, are on this day. I mean, 4,000 is very, from Allied point, is a very conservative um, figure. And obviously there's going to be air crews that are going to be lost as well and, 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 and people dying of wounds later. So, you know, who knows exactly how many British soldiers and servicemen were wounded and, and, and killed in this engagement. But it's hopefully for that we'll bring things to a close fairly soon. We've done some justice bringing this, bringing Operation Charmwood. We haven't covered everything, of course. There's only so much you can do. And I've deliberately avoided talking about Dempsey and Crocker and the, and the senior figures. It's not it's not what my interest is. There's other historians can talk about whether or not generals failed or did as much as they could or couldn't do and the arguments between Lee Mallory and Ted are... And, it's not that I don't care about this. I prefer hearing what Colin was saying about the HLI and Ben said about the East Riding Yeomanry, what the Duncan's been adding about the staffs and what have you. That's what, what kind of um, gets my juices flowing, so to speak. So um, do some panning shots around the cemetery, guys. I'll put on Colin's camera for a second. Colin is also there with Francois, and it's just beautiful. It's just any, anything you want to say, Colin, before we bring things to an end? No, I'm good. I'm good, but I just, yeah, uh, just if I can you jump visit in a minute. These places because they don't get visited because the story just isn't known. I mean, if you look at Twitter today, right, the stuff Charmwood is all over Twitter if you follow the right people. But yeah. how many people who do come to the battlefields are following these people on social media? And so they're, they're, they're missing out on so much important history in Normandy. That is often ignored because they want the greatest hits to her. I mean, and it, we oh. were talking to Karine, who's joining us tomorrow. The, the, the thing is, there's lots of information about this, these units, but you have to kind of buy divisional histories. You have to buy Gary Waite's <laughs> Lincoln's book and Mark Forsdyke Suffolk's books. Yeah. And you can end up spending several hundred pounds and still not have got all the units. There mm -hmm. isn't much in the way of a general history that covers sword to con. You get the big no, operational not. ones that cover Epsom and Goodwood and Blue Coat, but they're, they're, we need a nice book that covers from June the 6th to July the 9th, Soars to Cons. If anyone watching this wants to do a, a, a book about that, although Karine, who we're going to bring on tomorrow, Karine is thinking about doing that. I'm hoping Karine is watching this now, getting some ideas for tomorrow, because it, we, we need a nice book and also bringing in the French experience. We've got the civilian side of things. And we're going to do a show at some point about the civilians who were sheltering in the quarries south of the city and the resistance and people like Andre Heinz who was involved. We want, we'll mention them tomorrow, but we want to do a separate show about that. And um, well, I think, I think if, if you guys, I mean, Duncan, you want to say something, don't you? But um, yeah, I do indeed. Right. What I'd like to do is to place, I'm just measuring it out now. Right. I would just like to place our little cross on behalf of World War II TV, for Dan. So that okay, so we reckon that's rest. where the ashes are. That's it, in line five paces off. Yep, there we go in the rough. Fantastic stuff, Duncan. So and there fantastic, we go, so. Colin. And thank Francois as well for driving for Colin. And um, 
Yeah, you been a brilliant week. I've enjoyed today's show, and I think people have enjoyed watching it. I think, and um, and um, if you want to do a well, 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 me and Ben can carry on do a summary of things if you if when you two are driving back to Bayer and I'll. But it's been good. Um, so um, yeah, thank you for doing everything. It's been fantastic. Um, um, and we've just had a question to all of us, I guess, and from James Broom. Will this change the way you now conduct your future tours? And the answer is, of course, yes providing that our clients want to be uh, doing something a bit different. That's the problem. We, we have to, you know, Duncan, Colin, Ben, me, we're all tour guides, me a bit less so than the other three. But if people ask us to go to places like Pegasus Bridge and Merville Battery and Sword Beach and Aramanche, it's hard to persuade them. You know what? You could go there, but also why don't we go to saint Conte, Galmanche, Caen? But you've got to sell we, it. It's got to come both ways. We will be happy to take people to these sites, but the public have to ask to want to see them as well. It's got to be a two way street. So yes, James, we'd love to do more stuff doing this, but it's, it's a question of, um, oh, there's Collins. Hello, Colin. Um, it's Hello, a matter Paul. of people wanting to show us stuff. So there we are. There's, so there's Colin Taylor, everybody. Objective D Day. Follow him on Twitter. He's, a, he's very knowledgeable about the Northern Regiments, given his accent there. The DLI is his favourite, isn't it? It is indeed. The DLI is. Yeah. And, um, and Duncan is ex-guard. So Duncan is, we're going to bring Duncan in the future shows about operations like Goodwood and stuff that the guards are involved in. Maybe not this year, maybe next year. There's only so much we can fit in in one year. But we're going to, you know, if you guys want to head off to Bayer soon, you've, you know, they're, they're, we'll, we'll do that. And thank are you. Are you seeing that, it's that pub o'clock? So, sorry? Is it pub o'clock? It's pub. It's getting to pub. We, we, me and Ben can carry on wittering on, but you've got to drive back and I'll meet you at the yeah. pub later. Okay. Brilliant. Cheers. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Cheers, Brilliant Ben. Stuff. Thank you, gents. Thanks for your help. So um, if we want to do any conclusions to this, I mean, I don't know what you're, you're feeling, Ben, but I think Charnwood is, is definitely an operation that more people should look into. And I've learned a lot in the last week just doing the research for this, you know, because as you say, I mean, I, from, if I'm kind of paraphrasing you, you, your reason for getting into this was simply because of your relationship with Alan King. Um, and my reason for getting into Charmwood now is simply because I decided to do this show. And I'm really glad I did it because I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's nice to bring a spotlight to something a bit different. So, um, yeah, anything, uh, you know, you want to say about... Um, about the fighting from between Sword and Corn. Now is your platform, Ben, because uh, I've got half an hour before they'll get to the pub, <laughs> so I can keep on talking. And now we'll, we'll bring it to a hot end fairly soon. But uh, um, I, we we touched on it quite earlier on uh, in in June, and when you start to look, research, or read up on uh, the battle for Khan especially. Uh, you can see what a war of attrition it really ju does become. Uh, I spoke to someone uh, from the Netherlands this morning, and we we're talking about the the airborne uh, divisions, both respective American and, and the British, and how long they were both in the lines for. Uh, and then we we spoke briefly about Operation Charmwood and who the British and the Canadians were were up against uh, as you come towards uh, the. Uh, start of Charmwood, then onwards, Good, Goodwood, uh, and then down towards Falaise. But yeah, the first SS, second, the the ninth and tenth, the twelfth SS, the Panzerleer, the twenty first, all in that. On, on a map, it looks big, but when you're on the ground, like we've just done, you're talking kilometres apart from each uh, infantry division. Well, uh, let's bring up that map again, just to conclude what, and we've only done. Um, oh, it's gone a bit weird there. Hang on. There we go. So we only covered, so there's the whole of Operation Charmwood there. Um, and you've got 21st Panzer over here to the east towards towards Rouen. And you, so we only covered this area here from Galmanche, Buron, as far as saint Conte. Then we went back up to Combo. So we only did that little bit there. And you could see the distances um uh yeah you know those those fields we were showing earlier on and we you know we mentioned ben thank uh, gratefully gave us some information about the third div over here in libisi but you know we've 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 only covered a fraction of this battle we haven't covered the nova scotias over here the regina rifles um they're all pushing over this here and abby dardenne was an absolute bastard declare excuse my french um 
And we, you know, we could come back next year and do another Charnwood show of the same length of time and, and focus on completely different units. And we would, you know, and we still wouldn't be doing it justice. So, uh, and you're absolutely right. You're bang on about the fact that the quality of the German foe in this area is often under underappreciated. And we're not, it's not that we're making a, an effort to belittle the American involvement or anything right. else happening further west because they've got terrain issues and, and bocage and they've got to battle up the Cherbourg, battle down to San Lo. But it has to be said, 21st Panzer, uh, 12th SS, you've got 10th SS, 9th SS further south. Uh, uh, they, they are some formidable fighters. And, and yet, as we've always said in these films, as we push on south and we, we best these German forces, we are able to replace, as, as, as tragic as the loss of Corporal Wilkes is, there's a new Sherman tank there the next day. We've got new, we've got replacement units and men, particularly the, the equipment is coming in. Every Panther we knock out, if it was eight Panthers were knocked out by the self-held guns near uh, Buron that Colin told us about, the 26th Panzer, Reg uh, Panzer Regiment, if they did lose eight Panthers that day, they cannot replace those Panthers at all. That's it. That's that's okay. that's part of their strength completely gone, as they'd lost yeah. them in Brett Villorgeurs back on June the 7th. So the German is smashing itself to bits against our, our, our advance. And so this whole nonsense we've got over the last, well, not so much recently, 30 years ago, of the British being slow and the British being... Um, um, desperately cautious fighting near near Caen. It, it really isn't borne out by the fact we absolutely, by the end of August, have smashed the best part of Army Group B in Normandy. Um, I don't know what your feelings are on that, Ben. And I, I, I'm, I'm glad to be part of a movement to big up the Brits and Canadians this year and really celebrate what they did in some of the, the horrendous fire they were under in Charmwood 76 years ago today. I think for myself this evening, one one figure that, that Duncan gave us for the second and sixth South Staffordshire and their losses uh, just effectively in Galmonch were quite considerable. Uh, and if you compare that to the East Riding Yeomanry who were supporting them, uh, the East Riding lost two officers and eight other ranks. Two tanks were destroyed with two others damaged, but due to be... Uh, recovered uh, and repaired so that that probably doesn't sound an awful lot compared to the uh, the south staffs but uh, for the east riding that was their most deadliest day so far in normandy yeah. for for the unit themselves i mean we've got people commenting here um thomas is saying uh, during that's when we caught, got me caught me Bowing my nose there during june and july 951 panzers and stugs were destroyed and damaged um that's one set of figures. One figures I read from one book, and you know, the, all these figures you take with a grain of salt. But the figure I, I often I, I quote and say, look, it could be not 100% right, is the Germans lost 1,800 armored vehicles between June the 6th and July the 31st. And in that same time frame, they had 18 replacements. Now, maybe those figures are out by a few hundred here and there, but 1,800 lost, 18 replacements come in is so vastly different to what we're losing. And if we do an Operation Goodwood show, um, you know, yes, we lose X number of tanks, but we've replaced half of those tanks by the by within 48 hours, and and that's that's this key difference that we have this strength in depth to do it to do what we can. And so, there's still conversations going on there. Nicholas Patton, Sheldrake Six, Martin Har Har Harley, all these guys are joining in about the battles of Operation Windsor, and uh, and I'm I'm really pleased that our talking is also pr promoting other More. side conversations here. It's great. It's uh, yeah. people meeting each other and understanding what's going on because we cannot possibly cover it all in one yeah. production. So yeah. I think we'll draw it to an end very very short. We've done our, we've done an hour and forty five minutes. So for those watching this World War Two TV, I think most of you are regulars. If you're new to the channel, please click subscribe, click the little bell to get notifications about when I upload new videos and announce new ones. Um, if you'd like to consider supporting what we do financially, because I like to make this kind of my main um, my main job, frankly, and, and kind of do some guiding, but do this kind of full time, please consider being a patron on Patreon. There's a link there in the description below. To talk about tomorrow's show, I talked about it early, same time, same place, same channel, 7 p.m. French time, 6 p.m. UK time. We've got Mag, my other half, is our camera team one. And Gwen, who's who's a French guy living in uh, Caen, is camera team two. And we've got Karine, who is a, a well-established French tour guide and um, expert on everything 
who's going to be joining us, talking to us about the actual city of Khan, some of the stories of the resistance. And, and Ben was mentioning earlier the Red Crosses they're putting out, and Duncan was saying that. We're going to, we're going to go to in some more detail tomorrow. Some amazing then and now stuff. That photo behind you is of my great uncle, uh, behind me, great uncle Cyril there, standing in front of Pharmacy the Progray. And I believe his daughter, Barbara, who is my cousin once removed. I haven't seen Barbara or Barr in about 30 years. She may be watching tonight. She may be watching tomorrow. If you are, that's the Rand side of my family, which is the West London part. I don't, I'm from Essex, but we're hoping some of more of Cyril's uh, family will be watching. And we'll tell you the story about how that photo was came to be. We'll take you down those, those very streets. We'll show you where he set up his 15 platoon headquarters in Caen. And we'll do about the taking of Caen, show you some bullet things and things like that. So I think that's it. Um, I'm going to go and join the guys at the pub. I wish Ben could join us at the pub. It's if, if I had one of those, you know, USS Enterprise, you know, um, uh, transporter things to just beam you up and bring you to Caen, we'd, we'd happily buy you a Guinness. And um, one well, thing we forgot to do tonight, we, we and Duncan and Colin, we, we were going to bring in the Navy support because there was um, a counterattack. 21st Panzer started pushing off towards the, the advance on Operation Charmwood and there was a lack of uh, the, uh, enough British and Canadian SPGs in there. So we called upon the Navy. The Navy, don't forget, are only a few miles north of Sword Beach. And we were going to bring in the uh, HMS Rodney was the, one of the main uh, ships involved. And we thought for a joke and British people will get this and Canadians and Americans. Well, we might call HMS Rodney Dave for the whole show in an only fools and horses reference there. And we thought, would people get it if we kept saying, so Dave is fine for the beaches there. Ben's laughing. Ben gets it. If you don't, if you're not getting that, just look up on YouTube, the sketch of when Trigger asks, uh, uh, Rodney asks Trigger in Only Fools and Horses why he calls him Dave, and that's where well, you'll understand why Rodney and Dave. But in the end, we didn't do that joke, so what the hell, we'll save that for another one. But yeah, Ben, thank you very much. Your knowledge about the East Riding Yeoman in all things concerning Charmwood and Caen is superb, and um, we hope to meet you again in Bayer when you can get over here and bring some tours, and we'll, we'll there's a Guinness. Do you drink Guinness? Uh, yeah, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say, but hopefully, it's, if things go to plan, in, hopefully in two weeks' time, I should be out there. So. Well, there, there's a there's a cold Guinness yeah. or a, or whatever beer you want waiting for you in Bay, and you can come Thank and join you. that group of of um of reprobates and talk World War Two and and lots of bollocks. So um. Thank you very much for watching this. I've enjoyed it. Thank you, Ben. We've thanked Duncan Colin. This is Paul Woodad for World War II TV, bringing it all to an end. So thank you very much for watching. Join us again tomorrow for part two. Thank you. Good night, Ben. Thank you. Yeah, stream has been ended. Fantastic. So yeah. there we are. That was good. That was. I enjoyed it.